Chris Van Meter, Frontier Siege is the place to be for copies of this card in his deck. Very excited about the possibility of this card, and with a lot of the cons, dragons, designs, I think people are anticipating that, well, you're playing this card probably for one effect or the other. Not the case with this deck. Uh, definitely looking to either make two mana a turn or have flyers fight with cards like Hornet Queen. And Elvish Mystic is where things begin here for BBD. He's coming in the Coming to the red zone, excuse me, for one point of damage. It is a jungle hollow to follow up. He will gain a life, and we are underway here in round number one of 15 from Washington, D.C. Jake Byram, his opponent, did start with a Sansep Citadel. He is playing OBS on Aggro, a deck that Brian, of course, is very familiar with. Played in our Players' Championship at the end of last year. Also won a PTQ with it. So he's very familiar with this strategy, as there is a copy of Air of the Wilds. Jake will pass the turn back over to Brian, and we'll see what Brian can wrap into, because his deck is very powerful once he gets his mana online. Well, unfortunately for Brian, it looks like he's missing a land drop here, which is problematic with, with nothing to play and possibility of Jake killing his mana creature, setting him even further behind. Take a look at the removal here in Byram's deck. He does have four copies of Heroes Downfall. And four Obson Charms, which of course will not take care of the Elvish Mystic. So not a ton of removal to get that Mystic off the table. And with the Temple coming into play tapped, it looks like that Mystic's still going to stick around, but it is a cause for concern, as here comes the Air of the Wilds into the red zone. Brian here, of course, electing not to block. His deck needs a lot of mana. Four copies of Frontier Siege going all the way up to Ugin the Spirit Dragon. Fleece Main Lion will come into play. Brian will draw his card for the turn, and all he can do is simply pass the turn back. You know, this is... One of the things that can happen with a ramp strategy, you have to imagine if Brian kept a two-land hand with Elvis Mystic looking to draw the third one to play Frontier Siege and then really go bonkers. And he's got a lot of mana in his deck. He's got 23 lands alongside four Elvis Mystics, four Sylvan Caryatids, four copies of Corsair Crufix, which sort of count as mana, uh, but just a little unfortunate break here for Brian thus far. It's not impossible for him to get back into this game, though this is something that the Obs on Aggro deck does very well, is it kind of preys on opponents who kind of stumble and fumble around. It is an aggressive deck, after all, as Jake will be coming into the red zone here with Fleece Main Lion and Air of the Wild. So it'll be an attack here for five, and Brian will take those five points of damage. So he'll go a little bit lower, and it looks like Byram does have a follow-up in Siege Rhino, a card that Brian is, of course, very familiar with, playing it across multiple formats. So the big rider will come into play. It'll gain Byram some life. It'll drain BBD down to 11. And he's got to draw that land, like, right now. Absolutely. Excuse me, absolutely. I think that Jake there would have been better served playing the Siege Rhino before combat there to get a first trigger out of the Air of the Wilds. But yeah. I think Brian doing this thought sees just for information's purposes. He's going to go down a little bit lower here. You'll see a hand of Wingmate Rock, a Fleece Bane Lion, Heroes Downfall in case of Coilos. So Brian didn't know what he was up against, which I imagine he did, given his knowledge of this deck and the knowledge of the format. He certainly knows now. Well, I like the information Thoughtseize uh, in general. Uh, Brian's likely doomed this game, but you might as well see what's up, especially week one of a new set, because you don't know if there's some weird new card hanging out in your opponent's deck that you may not anticipate. Now, taking a look at Byram's list, you're not going to find any new content, but this isn't a deck that really needs any new content. There are some different changes to his deck. For example, Air of the Wild's not a card you always see in this deck. He does have four copies of that. He's also starting four copies of Soldier of the Pantheon a card that you typically don't see in OBS on aggro. You'll typically find more removal. So you're not going to find a lot of changes. You're certainly not going to find any new cards, but no, no new cards really necessary for this archetype. No, I mean, it is what it is. Definitely some options, like Soldier of the Pantheon, that people generally don't play. It might be well served to have it this weekend if you're anticipating a lot of gold threats. There's a lot of popular ones, a lot of powerful ones in the new set, but... The deck has a lot of room for customization, but the cards that are already in the deck are so powerful that I don't know if there's a lot of room to really move things around. See so Brian doing go down to two. Byram, certainly in the driver's seat this game, has not too much to worry about. A follow Fleece Main Line and a passing of the turn will send it back BBD's way. He will draw a card to Sylvan Carry out and he will concede the game. So Jake Byram is going to win game number one here over Brian Brown doing. Obs on aggro, up a game here over Greenback Constellation. We will see what the Constellation deck has in the sideboard, however. Three copies of Read the Bones, three copies of Nissa World Waker, two Garrick Apex Predator, a third copy of Ugin, two Heroes Downfalls, a Thoughtseize, three copies of Bioblight. I think that Brian really needs to shore up his early game here. So the three copies of Bioblight and the two Heroes Downfalls, I think, help a lot. I don't know if he's really going to want to sideboard that much past it, as the top end of his deck is already good enough to beat Jake if he gets there. So I think going to things like Nissa's or Garrick's, probably not what Brian wants to do here. Fair enough. We take a look at Jake's side of things, and I'm seeing something I've never really seen before. The one-card sideboard? Yes, one Whip of Erebos. Okay. That's all he needs. Well, I guess Jake may or may not bring in the Whip of Erebos. <laughs> there you go. Makes our analysis pretty thin, so I suppose we'll see if he brings that in or not here. 
as these players do get ready for game number two. Now, Brian's deck, we didn't get to see much of it in action there, but what's going on here is he has a Frontier Siege deck, first and foremost. Four copies of that brand new card to help him ramp into Ugin, help him ramp into one of the four copies of Hornet Queen he's playing. Can also put together a pretty disgusting turn with Eidolana Blossoms and Doomway Giant as well. There's all sorts of things that this deck can do once it gets a boatload of mana, which is why you see Nykthos in these strategies. Brian's only playing one as Frontier Siege is sort of generating that effect for him, but if he's able to untap with that card in play, he's got a lot of explosive lines of play, as you just mentioned. Well, while these players do get ready for Ganymer to see Brian studying over the options that he does have available, we will talk about the feature match area here with SCG Live. You guys can join it right now via twitch.tv. Yeah, the, tw the chat is back, though if you're not a subscriber, you are in slow-mo chat, which means that you can only post once every two minutes. If you subscribe for only $4.99 a month, you get the option to post as much as you like and access to custom emoticons and badges. A lot of emoticons available, more on the way, of course. There is Patrick, myself, and Matthias Hunt, along with our Jetpack Penguin and our Slow Play Turtle. If you have any ideas for emoticons, we'd love to hear about them. But you can subscribe now and watch twitch.tv slash scglive. Join the feature match area today as we do get prepared here for game number two. Brian Brondwin will be on the play. Interesting to see him playing in the first round. I was a little surprised when Nick Miller told me that we'd have him for the first round, but Brian is with, he's outside of the top 32, which means he has no buys coming in this tournament, which is a big deal. He qualified for the season one, uh, excuse me, qualified for the Players' Championship through season one, and then really didn't play that much for the remainder of the year until we got to some of the Invitationals and the Players' Championship. That means that as the year goes on, he's going to have a lot of points dropping off. And uh, oddly enough, as you mentioned, finds himself with zero buys for this event, something I would not have guessed myself. Yeah, I was a little surprised to see him in round one here in the feature match area. And unfortunately for him, he's already down a game. But some players, of course, in attendance here that do have two buys. And there's quite a few of them. We mentioned right at the top of the show that Joe set not in attendance with his 176 Open Series points. But Ross Merriam, Jim Davis, Kevin Jones, Logan Mai, Stephen Mann from the Florida area, Dylan Donegan, the season four Invitational Champion. Champion last year in Seattle, Tom Ross, Chris Van Meter, Brad Nelson, Danny Jessup, Gerard Fabiano, Andrew Boswell, Todd Anderson. Those are players with two buys in the top 16. They're all in attendance. Yeah, a lot of turnout from our top 16 here. DC, a pretty reasonable drive for a lot of those players, but I think some of them, like the Florida crew, flying up for this event. Yeah, looking to get those open series points. You throw in Andrew Jessup, that's Danny's brother. You've got Anthony Lowry, Rudy Briska, Jake Mondello. Those are all players with one buy. Steve Rubin, the last time we were here, he won the tournament. So he is within range as well. He's in 37th place. No buys for him, but very skilled player nonetheless. So we'll see what kind of breaks here. You know, with the 570, 507 players, excuse me, a, a healthy turnout, but there's a high density of very skilled players here this weekend. It's going to be a, a tough tournament. You know, I, I think that a lot of people get in their heads that the bigger the events are, the more challenging they are. There's some truth to that. There can be additional rounds and so forth, but most of the good players show up to everything. So the small events means that you're going to be playing against a higher quality of opponent on average than you do in the larger events. It's going to make for a very fun tournament. New decks, new cards, great players doing battle. Brian very quick, quickly keeps his opening hand. He has a jungle howl to begin, so he's at 21. Game number two is underway here. We'll see if he can get a better start than he had in the last game as Byron will draw a card. Byron does have a copy of Sansep Citadel. That's where he will begin things. He'll pass the turn back over to BBD. There is an Elvish Mystic and just a passing of the turn. So Brian maybe keeping another sketchy hand. Again, only 23 lands in his deck, but he does have an Accelerant there. I think having already mulliganed, it's hard to turn down this hand. There is a copy of Fleece Main Line. One thing we know about Abzan Aggro is unrelenting in how it beats down the opponent. Looks like Brian does have a thought seize to cast here. So he will cast that. We'll take a look at Byram's hand. There's a hero's downfall among those cards. Looks like there's also a copy of Rakshasha Death Dealer, but he will lay it out. Make that two hero's downfalls, along with the Wingmate Rock and a Soldier of the Pantheon. Third land is a copy of Temple of Malady. So right now, Byram's third land will enter the battlefield tapped, which means that Elvis Mystic will likely survive to the next turn. This is a very solid hand here for Jake. Uh, even if Brian goes ahead and takes the Death Dealer, Jake can still add to the board on his turn with Soldier of the Pantheon, plus two copies of Heroes Downfall with the corresponding third land and second black mana. A very hard hand in here to Thought Seize. And Brian's got to worry about the game going on for a long time and Wingmate Rock potentially being an issue as well. So 
not the hand that Brian wants to see here. Brian will select the death dealer. That'll go to the graveyard. There's a Nykthos. This is a Sylvan Gary added. Now he's got some mana. That was a very big turn, I think, for Brian. That was huge. He's got a blocker now for the Soldier of the Pantheon that's likely coming this turn from Jake. He's got a lot of mana, and as we know, because he missed land drops, a handful of spells to work with. Temple will make the top card the bottom card. And it looks like we will see Jake play that soldier, though it could be a thought season. Well, it will be a soldier. And now in comes the Fleece Man line, Bron doing. We'll go down to 16. We'll see if he has something like a Frontier Siege here or not. Here's four mana being tapped rather quickly. And there is Frontier Siege. And now this is the big addition to this deck. Brian is going to select cons. And the con side of this is the beginning of each of your main phases. Add green, green to your mana pool. So Brian goes to a second main phase, deploys an Elvish Mystic, and passes the turn back. Yeah, you get an immediate rebate on this card, and then it's one-sided Eladombre's Vineyard. Very potent effect. On the dragon side of this, in conjunction with Hornet Queen, can also do some real damage. Yeah. Now there's a copy of Anafenza. No slouch. Byron going to come to the red zone with both of his creatures, maybe. Just Fleece Main Line. That one's a little bit safer. Brian's going to take that damage. He's going to go down to 13. But now we get to see what he can do. I think if I'm Jake there, I, I want to send in the Soldier of the Pantheon as well. It cuts Brian off of two mana here, as it's minus one devotion for the Nykthos. And he's down the Elvish Mystic if he blocks. I'm not really sure what the Soldier of the Pantheon is doing otherwise, because Brian also has a Sylvan Carry added that he's periodically going to be able to block with. Green, green here in the first main phase. That's kind of a freebie to activate Nykthos. Nykthos right now is going to be generating four green mana. Brian figuring out how he wants to use all the mana he's going to have available. Don't forget, the second main phase, he's going to get two green as well there. So we'll see what he can put together again. We know he's got spells, not playing lands. Yep. But does he have one of his big payouts here? That's the question. And that's always the big trick for the ramp decks. Can you find the right combination of mana acceleration and then the big payout card? Well, I see a lot of mana being tapped. And that's a payout card. That's an Ugin the Spirit Dragon. And the elevator might be going down on the Spirit Dragon. We'll see. It can certainly go up and use that plus three to deal some damage or something. But this is not a bad turn, to say the least. Three damage is going to go over to the Fleece Main Lion. Brian going to pass the turn back and say, do your worst. And now remember, Jake cannot grow the Soul of the Pantheon with Anafenza. Yep. Protection from multicolored, after all. So coming up with an extra three points of damage is pretty difficult here for a deck like Gobs and Aggro. Now, we, knew that, we know there's a hero's downfall, and that's going to go after Uga. So we knew that was going to be coming, as he did have two in his hand when Brian did Thought Seize him. So, of course, it begs the question of, is that the best use of Ugin on that turn? But you have to assume that Brian knew that was something that was going to happen. Well, I don't know if Brian can really just minus and, and reset the game. Yeah. Maybe he can, but he knows that Jake has removal spells plus wingmate rock left over in his hand. Uh, Brian may not be able to play draw go with Jake from that spot. That's a tough spot, too, because if he resets the game, he minuses the, uh, the Ugin. He's killing all his own stuff, and he's left with two lands. Yeah. So we'll see if he can put something else together here this turn. He's down to seven. Frontier Siege out there cranking out all this mana, but does he have something good to do with it? A card like Hornet Queen, chances are, could probably just win him the game straight up, but he doesn't have one like right now, it seems. Yeah, Hornet Queen is likely good enough from this spot, and he's playing four copies. But I think we would have seen that last turn instead of... Ugin if it was available to Brian. Yeah. So most likely does not have it. And Brian's going to keep in the tank now. Try to figure out what he can do to work himself out of this situation. Rather fitting, playing against the deck that he knows so much about and has played so many games with and has won so many matches with here in Avzon Aggro. A different take here from Byron with the Soldier of the Pantheons, but same strategy nonetheless. I think Soldier may be poised for a bit of a comeback here. Just a lot of decks that blocking and removing it is problematic. Uh, the problem is for a deck like Ob's on Aggro, you have somebody who comes to play tap lands. It's hard to reliably cast it on turn one without doing too much damage or mana. But 
I think Soldier of the Pantheon's a little underplayed right now. Brian just going to pass the turn back. Seemingly nothing to do, but for some reason, I don't believe that's the case. Yeah, the opponent who's been missing all the land drops, I suspect something's going to happen here. Byram's going to get into the red zone here with Anna Fenza and Soldier of the Pantheon. There's a block there. Smells like maybe a hero's downfall, some sort of removal spell to get the Anna Fenza off the table, and there is a hero's downfall. So that'll take care of Anna Fenza. Of course, Soldier cannot be pumped by Anna Fenza due to protection from multicolored, so Carrie added free to block there. The big question now for Byram is, do you have that fifth land for the wingmate rock? As the ray trigger will occur. Looks like four mana's being tapped. Rhino will be just fine as well. So a little drain, a little gain. And Brian is certainly still in some trouble. Rhino having trample, a big deal here. Absolutely. I mean, Brian's got a... I mean, uh, until he can answer the board here, he's looking at chump blocking, and that you only have so much time to do that against Siege Rhino. Also, keep in mind, again, still the wingmate rock looming, which is a big concern for Brian. Frontier Siege out there still cranking out mana, but is there anything that he can do with it? Still with just two lands in play. You have to imagine spells in hand. That wingmate rock looming the entire time. Looking for a Hornet Queen, ideally. As you mentioned, four copies of that card in his deck. Yeah, it's almost it's almost hard to imagine exactly what's going on in Brian's hand right now. Yeah, it he really missed is. land drops and he really hasn't been too efficient casting spells. There is a swamp. So it looks like he drew a land this turn. I think this looks like it's going to generate some mana. This looks like it's going to be six mana now. Nykthos generating four mana, able to pay for Nykthos through the Frontier Siege. This looks like it might be Ugin again. Yes, it is. All right. It's tough here because I feel with Ugin here, he's almost committed to minus fouring yep. if he's going to do that. And then he's down, you know, effectively his board as well. Yeah, minus four in this situation does kill everything, which isn't so bad. And it leaves an Ugin on the table. We know that Jake does have a copy of Hero's Downfall in his hand. So Brian's just going to tick up his Ugin, take care of the Soldier of the Pantheon, pass the turn back. And it looks like he's going to be on blocking duty with that Sylvan carry added. Yeah, I think that's the play that Brian has to make here. I think minusing the Ugin and resetting here is not a tenable position. I don't think so either. Brian with two main deck copies of Ugin in his deck. Jake kind of coming to the red zone. Brian can't block fast enough. Carry added will get destroyed. A little bit of trample damage there. Brian going to go down to three. I would be surprised if we don't see a hero's downfall go after the Spirit Dragon, and it will. So Ugin number two is taken care of. Here's a replacement Soldier of the Pantheon, just a passing of the turn. So Brian is now out of Ugin's in his deck unless he boarded in his third copy. Somebody needs a Hornet Queen. He needs one, like, right now. Very added. Perhaps going to buy him some more time to try to find that Hornet Queen. Although, if Brian keeps taking little points of damage here from the Siege Rhino, it's possible not even Hornet Queen gets him out of the woods eventually. Yeah. As, as Trample again creates a bunch of problems. There's another. So he boarded the other one in. All right. So now this is the last one. <laughs> okay. So we're going to replay this game again. But I still think he's in the same situation he was in last turn, which is he can't tick down Ugg to destroy everything. Correct. Now, to be fair, the two heroes' downfalls are gone. He doesn't know if Jake has another one, so it's not out of the realm of possibility to say, OK, Ugin, let's tick down, destroy everything four or less, get the Siege Rhino off the table, and then Hope that Jake, I suppose, doesn't draw land, even though, you know, that's not the best strategy in the world. 
to yeah. play as wingmate rock? It, it's tough for, for that reason. It's, you know, Brian, if he resets the entire board, if Jake has an untapped land, just a 3-4 flyer is likely to kill Brian next turn. Yeah. That said, he's risking a lot by allowing Jake to go into his turn with a siege rhino. Yep. So uh, Brian squeezed in multiple directions here. He's going to take up moving again. Same play as last turn, pass the turn back. Byron's going to quickly untap and take a draw step. Now, throughout all of this, Brian is hoping that Jake never draws a siege rhino, but what can you do then? Yeah, and now even Obzon Charm is lethal. This play that Brian, Brian made here gives him a shot to win if Jake doesn't have anything else going on in his hand besides the wingmate rock, because he has insurance against that. Now, the big question is, if he doesn't have anything else in his hand besides the wingmate rock, what does he have? Because he hasn't played lands either. Yeah, you know? no, it's, you know, there's, there's risks either way. Now, this is a good sign if you're Brian. Jake's attacking with a siege round. He pointed towards Ugin, not Brian's life total. So Jake is saying, I don't have an answer for Ugin. Which is really surprising because I, I could see making this play if you were getting Ugin to a spot where it could not kill the wingmate rock in your hand. But if Brian says no blocks, you're only knocking the Ugin down to five. I mean, I guess in that case, Brian loses the Ugin, which is worth something, but... Well, Brian says, I'm still going to block the carry added, but I want my Ugin to have a lot of counters, so it's going to go down to eight. Now, let's see what the follow-up's going to be. That's a Fleecemane Lion. This is a copy of Air of the Wilds, and with Jake having just one card left in his hand, we all know what it is. Yep. It's Wingmate Rock, so perhaps... Ugin can stabilize this game as Brian will trigger his Frontier Siege. Is Ugin willing to tick down just yet and blow everything up? Brian's still in the dangerous situation of if that happens, Jake draws a land that enters the battlefield untapped and plays Wingate Rock, the 3 4 still a disaster. It's true, but Brian's hand might be forced here. If he didn't draw something significant, he can't really block out of the Siege Rhino next turn. So. Uh, I don't know what alternative he has. Yeah, and you see the shoulder shrug. Those dice are coming off. That means Ugin's going down. And he's got to kill a bunch of stuff with the Spirit Dragon. So the minus X ability, exile each permanent with converted mana cost X or less. Brian will deploy an Urborg, and right now he's trying to fade and land and there's the battlefield untapped. That's the big plan. And if he can do that for one turn, he might be able to run away with this. Yep. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's going to be tough because he's not going to be able to win this game that quickly. He has to be able to beat Siege Rhino as well. Well, he can't do that. Siege Rhino's going to get the job done. Jake Byram's going to win this match here over Brian Brondu in two games to zero. Siege Rhino, a card that BBD has won quite a few matches with, but it does him in to start off his day. He's 0-1. Still good. Yes, it is. Lots of new cards in favor for us, but I think Siege Rhino is still going to be good. Siege Rhino's going to be good for a long time, across many formats, mind you. You can see why Brian was playing with so many copies of Eidolon of the Blossoms in his list, which we see kind of fluctuate in and out of these decks. He needs some way to bridge the gap between his early man acceleration and his big payoff cards, while also generating some card advantage, because he's often going to be...